And we know all you kids are going to behave, right? <laughs> Deal with Vicky. <laughs> no problem. <laughs> Good morning, church. It's, it's always a pleasure to be in the house of God. <laughs> Well, this morning I have a message that wasn't the original message that I had intended to speak on, but I feel it's an important message, a timely message that I believe that we all need to hear. So before I begin, thank you, Rebecca. I'd just like to pray for the opening of this service. Father, we thank you that we're able to gather here in your name to be able to hear your word without worrying about someone coming in and arresting us or taking away our Bibles. We thank you, Lord, for the freedom that we have in this country, freedom to worship you in spirit and in truth. I ask that you would anoint your word this morning, Lord, as it goes forth, that it would take root in your people's hearts. And I just thank you this morning and praise your name. Amen. The gist of my message this morning is to go over some of the men that are in the Bible. Sometimes we look at them and we say, you know, how could we be like Moses or Elijah or David? But they were just normal men and women of the Bible that were used of God in sometimes spectacular ways. But nevertheless, they were men and women just like you and I. So I'd like to take a look at uh, the prophet Elijah this morning. He was a man that was sent from God. And the pages of our Bibles are filled with the accounts of men and women that seem larger than life. People like Moses, David, Daniel, and Paul, and others all seem to be characters that were so far above the realm of our own experience that we may feel that we could never be like them. But I'll let you in on a little secret. All of these people were just people, and the man in our text this morning was no different. When I read about the life and ministry of Elijah, I am amazed at his courage and that, at the power that he had with God. Yet I am reminded by the word of God that Elijah was a man subject to like passions as we are. And you can see that in James chapter 5, verse 17. He was just a man who walked in humble obedience before his God. And in this message this morning, I want you to see that God can take a nobody and make a somebody out of them. That God can take any life that will be totally yielded to his will and use that life for his glory. Elijah, he was a common man. And we'll just get into a little bit about his background. His home. In the Bible, it says that Elijah was from a place called Tishb. And in that region uh, known as Gilead. Gilead was a rough and mountainous area and was known for its high peaks and deep valleys. The very name Gilead in its Hebrew form means raw or rugged. This tells us that Elijah was 
a backwoods man, like a mountain man. And when he stepped onto the scene and began his ministry, his methods and mannerisms and his message were as rough and as rugged as the place that he called home. Elijah's method of dress was as strange as anything else that we know about him. And we can see that in 2 Kings chapter 1, verse 8. And they answered him, and he was a hairy man and gir- with a girdle of leather about his loins. And he said, it is Elijah the Tishbite. So I know in our modern day and age, we don't walk around girt with leather about our loins. I mean, if we do, then we can't see it. <laughs> but I won't go there. Uh, but again, he was a man of like passions, just like you and I. And in the book of James, it says that Elias was a man subject to like passions as we are, and he prayed earnestly that it might not rain, and it rained not on the earth by a space of three years and six months, And he prayed again, and the heaven gave rain, and the earth brought forth fruit. God used him mightily for him to tell King Ahab that it was not going to rain on the land for three and a half years, and it didn't. God used him in a mighty way. And in the same way, when it was time for it to rain again, he spoke, and the rains came. And to be used mightily that way in the hand of God is a great thing. But I'm sure that it's very humbling. So my main emphasis here is that the Lord is not looking for spiritual giants to use for his glory. He is simply looking for people who will readily obey his word and follow him where he leads them. You see, nothing is known at all about Elijah until he steps onto the scene in the presence of King Ahab. He was a nobody from nowhere, but he was handpicked by the Lord God to do his will and to carry his message to a wayward nation. You see, at the time, King Ahab was a very wicked ruler, and he married Jezebel. Most of you know the story. And uh, they were into Baal worship, which Pastor had showed us that little slide where they had put the the arch of Baal in New York City. And uh, what they were into was, um, well, I'm not sure. I might get into that later, but You see, God doesn't need the rich and the educated and the intelligent. He doesn't need the beautiful or the movers and shakers of the world to get his work done. And we can just remember David. And we can find that in 1 Samuel 16, verses 6 through 7, where Samuel the prophet was told to go to give a sacrifice and call Jesse to the sacrifice. And when he called him there, he was to anoint one of Jesse's sons as king. And so they brought forth the sons before Samuel, and one by one they were looking at their stature and, you know, what they have done. And Samuel says, no, this is not him. And they went through all the sons. And he says, do you have any more sons? And he says, yes, I have. My son David, he's out in the field tending sheep. And when David came, Samuel knew that that was God's anointed, and he anointed him king. But David, he was just a shepherd boy, just a regular guy like you and I, and God used him 
mightily. And then we also see uh, that God has chosen to work through the lives of men and women who will simply yield themselves to the will of God and who, like Isaiah, uh, when God was speaking to him, said, here I am. The bottom line is that God wants your obedient surrender to his will more than he wants anything else that you can give to him. You see, Elijah was just a common man, but he was also a courageous man. He defied a foolish ruler. The king of Israel during the time of Elijah was a man named Ahab. And according to the Bible in 1 Kings chapter 16, verses 30 and 33, Ahab was the most wicked king that ever squatted upon the throne of Israel. And besides that, he was married to a wretchedly evil woman named Jezebel. She was the daughter of the king of Zidon, and this too was an offense to the Lord. You can see that in 1 Kings chapter 16, 31. Jezebel was from a group of people <clears throat> who were ardent Baal worshippers, and she, along with her husband Ahab, did more to introduce the worship of Baal to the people of Israel than any other ruling family. This produced a state of affairs in Israel where people lost all regard for the commandments of God. And this is illustrated in 1 Kings chapter 16, verse 34. Yet it was to this king Ahab that God sent the prophet Elijah. Elijah walked right into the presence of King Ahab and delivered the message of the Lord without flinching. He told Ahab that there would be no rain or dew until he said there would be, and it took a lot of courage to defy the wicked ruler. You see, in those days, the king had power to kill you. You know, it says uh, in the scripture that the life, how does it go? Life is in the power of the tongue. Well, that relating to the kings in those days where they could just, you know, out with him. And they would take you out and they'd chop your head off. So it took a lot of courage to stand in front of the king and, and defy him. Uh, I just want to tell you a little story, if I may, just to show you how, uh, you know, sometimes we find ourselves in circumstances where we just don't know what to do. We've prayed, we've done all we can, and we just, you know, sometimes you just have to wait on God. And that's sometimes not an easy thing to do. Uh, but this is a little story about a pastor who was a uh, pastor of a Presbyterian church in San Francisco, and he was a pastor for over 20 years. And he had written a book called When the Wicked Seizes the City. And it says when this gentleman first met him, he expected to find the man in a chrome helmet with loaded weapons all around him and double bars on the door because his home had been firebombed. And the, uh, the uh, bedroom for his children, he had built it like a bunker so it would be fireproof so that his children could uh, survive. Uh, he was ministering uh, against homosexuality in, in, in his area of the city, and apparently uh, people came against him and, and tried to firebomb his house and, and kill him and his family. But he was telling a story of how he was sitting reading the newspaper one day and there was a council meeting being held the next day in San Francisco. And he thought he'd go to the city council and he wanted to hear what this particular issue. It was a homosexual rights issue. And he thought that he just couldn't sit there and let that pass. He didn't take anyone with him and he didn't take any placards. He didn't march against them like many of them that had marched against him. And it's not uncommon for his services to be, his um, 
church services to be interrupted by lesbians and homosexuals. And so he just went to the city council meeting and he sat and he heard the legislation and the council was about to take a vote. And the chairman said, is there anyone here who has anything to say? And no one moved. So he stood up and he said, I would like to say something. And he walked to the platform and he stated his name, that he was a citizen residing in the Sunset District of San Francisco. So they asked him, what would you like to say? And he replied, well, I would like to say nothing for myself, but I would like to quote three individuals that I've respected for years. And he read to them from Moses and Leviticus and from one of the Psalms by David and from Paul and Romans 1. He didn't preach, he didn't scream, he didn't sermonize. He just closed his Bible and he sat down. And they said, wait, before you sit down, who are these people? Who are these people, Moses, David, and Paul? And someone said, you're reading from the Bible, aren't you? And he said, yes, I am. And one of the council members said, I vote no. And another, and another, and it didn't pass. And he sat down and this is, you know, it took a lot of courage for him to do that. But um, so what I get through this is he made a stand and God honored that stand. And by honoring that stand, uh, this particular legislation was voted down. So that should encourage us to uh, know that God has our backs when we... Uh, stand against unrighteousness, against unrighteousness. Each one of us needs to manifest that same kind of courage. America today is headed down the same road that Israel was on back then, where they had uh, left the worship of Jehovah God and started worshiping Baal and idols. We have sacrificed our innocence for the pleasures of the flesh, and we have openly mocked the written word of God. I'm talking as America as a whole. We have turned a deaf ear to the cry of the millions of the unborn. Who are slain in the name of convenience every year in this country. We have paid homage to the onslaught of sexually explicit programming that invades our homes. <clears throat> we have sacrificed our morality to gratify our flesh. We have watched in mock homosexuality and lesbianism. We stand by in mute silence while the minds of our own children are captivated by the siren song of prosperity, selfish, indulgent, and independence from God. We pass their choices of music off as a fad. We have no say in where they go or what they do. We have watched this once great godly nation become seduced, reduced to a stagnated cesspool of iniquity, open sin and outright hostility to God Almighty. After Elijah was taken to heaven in the whirlwind, Elijah, Elijah took Elijah's mantle and smote the Jordan and cried, where is the Lord, of, where is the Lord God of Elijah? And this morning, I would ask you, where are the Elijahs of the Lord God? We need Elijahs in these last days to stand up and declare the truth. Elijah denounced a false religion, the crux of Elijah's message was that there would be no dew or rain until he said so. 
This was a direct attack against the false religion of Baal worship. You see, Baal was the Canaanite god of fertility. He was seen in the thunderheads and in the rain that fell. Baal worship was usually conducted on the tops of hills where statues of Baal were built. Typically, these Baal shrines were staffed by priests and priestesses. Worship was carried out through performing sexual acts with one of these ministers of Baal. It was their belief that when you were joined to a priest or priestess in sexual union, that you literally became a god or goddess for that period of time. One of the most horrible aspects of Baal worship existed in the realm of human sacrifice. When there was a time of drought, it was supposed to mean that Baal was angry with the people. To get his attention, they would often sacrifice a firstborn child by burning it alive. It was a terrible religion that existed to gratify the flesh. There is much more that could be said about Baal worship, but this is enough to see why it was an offense to the Lord God of Israel. After all, it involved breaking many of the commandments. When Elijah made his announcement, he was declaring war on Baal. It took great courage to stand up before the chief promoter of that false religion and in effect say, that my God is greater than Baal, and to prove it, God is going to shut off the spigot of rain until I say so. And there's nothing that you, Jezebel, or Baal can do about it. And that took courage. Can you imagine how, mu how much they must have laughed and mocked him? That is kind of courage we need to see manifested in this day. This is the kind of courage that was derived from time spent with God, and from an angry indigna indignation over the sins of the nation of Israel. This is the kind of courage that stands up against ridicule. It is the kind of courage that protests things like abortion, the homosexual agenda, and the erosion of uh, religious liberties. It is that kind of courage that makes a difference for God in these days of self-indulgence. It is the kind of courage that says, I will be different. Regardless of what it costs me or my family, I will stand for God. Can we all say that we are filled with that kind of courage? Can God count on us to make that stand? So we see so far that Elijah was a, a common man but he was also a courageous man. And now we will see that he was a committed man. His name, his very name tells us his testimony. The name Elijah means my God is Jehovah. His name tells us that he had a personal relationship with the God of heaven. This is the first and crucial step in becoming anything for God. Until you really know him, you cannot serve him. The only way to meet the Lord God is through his son, Jesus Christ. By walking into the presence of Ahab and Jezebel in the name of Jehovah, Elijah was demonstrating that his life and his ministry was totally dependent upon the Lord. He was not trusting in the arm of the flesh, but was resting in the everlasting arms by faith. There is a huge difference. This is the secret of success for a child of God living in this wicked world. Only when we are totally yielded to God and total dependence will we be assured of success. You see, there is only one thing that honors God, and that is faith. We must come to the place where we kick out all of our props and rest totally in the hand of divine providence. We must come to the place where we stop trying and start trusting for God to do it. We have plenty of people who live by plastic, credit cards, by job, by education, and by their ability 
by intellect, or by whatever. And what we need are people who will live by faith, depending on nothing but God to meet their needs, and, and, and he will enable you to stand. Now we'll look at uh, Elijah's devotion. The phrase that Elijah used, before whom I stand, Elijah was standing in the presence of the king of Israel. He was standing in the presence of one of the most powerful men of his time. Yet Elijah was able to see beyond the trapping of the throne room of Israel. Elijah knew that he was standing in the presence of God. He knew that there was no need to try and please Ahab. There was no need to soft sell his message to make it more pleasing. There was only one person in that room who he had who had to be pleased, and his name was Jehovah. You know, that is the place that we all need to get in our lives. If we can get beyond what this one or that one might think of us and live for nothing but to please the Lord God, then we are on the road to being used by him. Elijah was a man on a mission. He desired nothing less than carrying out the will of God. So I would ask you this morning, can you honestly say that we do not care what anyone thinks about us when we make a stand for God? Or are we worried about what they, what they say or what they think about us? Can we honestly say that we'll stand for God no matter what? This is the attitude of total commitment. This is the attitude that God can bless and that God can use. So we see that Elijah was a common man, he was a courageous man, and that he was a committed man, but he was also a confident man. Most of the other folks at his time were living like Jehovah was dead. And in some ways, it sounds like the days that we're living in now. A lot of people, you know, don't even believe that God is alive anymore or that he even exists. So we need people like Elijah today who will stand up and say, you can live like God is dead if you wish. But I'm going to live for him because he he's alive in me. You can see that was Elijah's, Elijah's situation. God was living in him, and when God lives in you, you just can't keep quiet. In the book of James, chapter 5, verses 17 and 18, it seems from these verses that the drought was Elijah's idea. Apparently, he was so upset with the sins of the people that he began to pray that it would not rain. Of course, this idea was put into his heart by the Spirit of God, no doubt. As he prayed, he received assurance that this was indeed the Lord's will. So he marched up to Ahab and told him that it would not rain, He believed that he served the God who was powerful and he was able to do anything. One of the tragedies of the modern church is the lack of respect we have for God and his ability. I just want to remind you this morning that you serve a God who can do anything. He can meet any any need that you have. He can heal any disease. He can stop anything from taking place and he can cause anything to take place. He is God, and he is all-powerful. Nothing is too hard for him. I'd just like us to remember that God is... God all the time in every situation, regardless of what we face in life. 
when we are battling sin, he is God. And when we have a need, he is God. When we are fighting Satan and his activities, he is God. He is God all the time. Never forget that. What he did for, his, the, what he did for people like Elijah, he can do for you and me. We just have to arrive at the place where we can trust in his ability. This man stood before Ahab because he had received a word from God concerning this matter. Elijah had enough sense to know that when God told him something was going to happen, that it would happen. God will never, never back away from a single promise that he had made to his people. He will not desert you. I'll leave you. If he has made a promise to you, it will be fulfilled. Again and again, God placed the prophet in circumstances that were beyond his power. And again and again, God proved that he was greater than everything Elijah was called on to face. God called Elijah to stand before Ahab and pronounce a sentence of divine judgment on the nation of Israel. Elijah's message was that it would not rain until he said it would, and it didn't. God sent, then sent Elijah to dwell beside an isolated stream in the wilderness. At that stream, God fed Elijah every morning and night with bread and meat carried to him on the wings of ravens. And when the brook went dry from the very lack of rain, Elijah prophesied, and God sent Elijah to a place called Zarephath to be fed in the home of a widow. And while he was there, God sent them a miraculously supply of food. And while he was there, the widow's son died, and God used Elijah to raise the dead back to life. All of those things and more helped prepare Elijah for the day when he would stand in the power of God and pray the fire down from heaven. If you have time, go into the uh, First Kings and read these stories that took place with Elijah. He, he lived quite the life. God used him in many ways. There is a desperate need today for spiritual heroes who will stand against the tide of heresy and apostasy. There is a need for the people of God to gauge their allegiance to the Lord and to determine where they really stand when it comes to being on the Lord's side. There must be a willingness to flee the evil that surrounds us and be a separate people for the glory of the Lord. There must be a willingness to renew our commitment to the Lord and place him above all other pursuits, interests, and loyalties. When we come to a place when we are willing to separate ourselves from everything that competes for our attention and yield to the God of heaven, then we will find ourselves drawn to him in true heart worship. Nothing in this world is more precious than a heart that is aflame with love for the Lord and a heart that burns with a desire to see God glorified, whatever the cost. And again, I, I go back to where I was sharing that God used normal people. If you recall, all David had was a sling, a shepherd's staff, and a few stones. But in the hand of God, he killed a giant. And all Moses had was a shepherd's staff, but in the hand of God, he parted the Red Sea. All a little boy had was five loaves and two fish, but in the hand of God, he, felt he fed a multitude. God doesn't need a lot to work with. In creation, God took nothing and made everything. All he is looking for from us is to place our faith in him. And when we do, everything changes. I'd like to share one more story with you, if I may. There was a man called Chaplain Robinson. His first name, we don't know, but he shared a true story about his grandmother that took place in 1949. His father had just returned home from World War II, and on every American highway you could see 
soldiers in uniform hitchhiking home to their families, as was the custom in the time of America, a time in America. Sadly, the thrill of his reunion with his family was overshadowed by the illness of Robinson's grandmother. The problem was her kidneys. The doctors told Robinson's father that she needed a blood transfusion immediately or she would not live through the night. The problem was that his grandmother's blood was type AB negative, a very rare type of blood even today. But even harder to get back then because there were no blood banks or air flights to ship blood. None of the family's members had matching blood. So the doctors gave the family no hope of her surviving through the night. Robinson's father left the hospital in tears to gather all the family members just so that they could say goodbye to the grandmother. As Robinson's father was driving down the highway, he passed a soldier hitchhiking home to his family. Deep in grief, the father had no inclination to do a good deed that, at that moment. Yet he felt strongly impressed to stop and pick up the stranger. Robinson's father was so upset that he didn't even ask the soldier's name. The soldier, however, noticed that he had tears in his eyes. And he asked him what was wrong. Through the tears, Robinson's father told the stranger about his dying mother in the hospital because they could not give her a transfusion of AB negative blood because they did not have any, and she would be dead by morning. It got very quiet in the car. Then this unidentified soldier extended his hand out to Robinson's father with the palm upward. Resting in the palm of his hand was his army dog tags with the blood type engraved on them AB negative. The soldier told Robinson's father to turn the car around and get him to the hospital where she was given a transfusion of this man's blood. Robinson's grandmother lived until 1996. 47 years later. And to this day, no one in the family knows the soldier's name. Robinson's father wonders if he was a soldier or an angel in uniform. So we see that Elijah stirred up a hornet's nest when he made his announcement before Ahab. However, the point is that Elijah did what God told him to do. Elijah was a man sent from God. He was sent to a wicked people to declare that judgment was coming from the hand of God. He was not afraid to speak up and expose the evils of his day. He was not afraid to live by and trust God all the way through. So I was just wondering this morning how many of us are like Elijah? How many of us are trusting God come what may? How many of us are taking our stand for God in the midst of this wicked world? How many of us are standing against the tide of evil in the world today? How many of us really know God like Elijah did? We need some Elijahs in our day today. Elijah's God has not changed. Where are the Elijahs who will believe him regardless of the cost? 
Well, that's the end of my message. And I would like to close this service with this song. Jesse, if you would, please. As we sing this song, uh, if you feel the need to come to the altar, if God is speaking something to your heart this morning, please feel free to come forward.